Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who have heard me speak before, this is not normally how I sound. Uh, I'm Julia Dolan. I'm the Minor White Curator of Photography. And uh, yes, here we are. <laughs> uh, I also normally don't sit when I give um, lectures, but I was going to weave a tale about how I was out until 3 AM raging at the club. Um, and that's how I lost my voice and my, my legs hurt from dancing, but sadly that's not the case. Just a little under the weather today. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll do this together, you, me, and, and Dayquil. Um, I didn't want to not have this lecture happen, certainly, because we have so many other events going on that um, focus on contemporary native photographers and the Edward Curtis legacy. So I hope that you're all able to attend one or more, especially because our contemporary artists are all coming back to give talks or uh, to show what they do. For instance, Will Wilson will be doing his uh, critical indigenous photographic exchange with his 8x10 camera and tintypes and so on. So um, we've got plenty coming up between now and May. But I'm thrilled that you're here today and I'll do the best that I can to get through this. Um, if any of you in the front row decide to move back, I will not be offended. <laughs> will not take it personally, but I, I, I won't emote too much, so I think you're safe. Um, and then at the end, I know sometimes people like to come up and speak to me afterwards, whether because they don't want to ask a question in front of everyone or they have something to show me. I'm normally all for that, but um, we're not gonna do that today. So if you have a question that you wanna ask me, be brave and ask it uh, with everyone. We'll have mics at the end that we can uh, move around so you can, you can talk. But I'm excited actually to talk about this subject. I gave uh, a shorter version of it uh, in Bend when Atelier 6000 had an exhibition of Curtis's work up back in the fall. And it was a really nice way for me to think about Edward Curtis, but not Edward Curtis in isolation because I think it's so easy for us to do that because uh, the North American Indian is such a powerful and important um, and complex work that um, it, to bring in other issues that are going um, on in terms of the art world and the photography world at the same time can be very, very complex. But I wanted to do that today because I think it's so interesting and explains a little bit more about why Curtis did what he did and the photographs he made look the way that they look. And so while I'm always very interested in getting into the ethics of the images and um, both the beauty and the problems that come out of this wonderful body of work, we're not really gonna do that today. And I'm not gonna talk about the, um, the contemporary photographers either, but we're gonna talk quite a bit about Curtis. Um, I'm not gonna show you as many images by Curtis, but I'm gonna show you images by his milieu, if you will, his contemporaries. and. I hope you understand that that's okay because you can walk to the other building and you can see them uh, for yourself firsthand, which is very exciting. Um, so forgive me, uh, from time to time I might have to pop a, a throat lozenge. I'm gonna try not to do that though um, and drink from this. I got this swag the other day, I'm very excited. I talked at uh, University of Oregon Night Library on Thursday. They had a symposium about Edward Curtis's work and they invited me to talk, which was very nice. Um, and it's keeping the tea really hot. But they have, um, it was amazing, the, one of the sets that we have, we have set number 55 of the North American Indian, which is all on Dutch Gelder paper, which is a wonderful printing stock. Um, their set is one of the family sets, and it's on Japanese tissue. And so it's more delicate, and so they have more damage in terms of little bits of crinkling and so on. But maybe I shouldn't tell this to you because it's not that I don't think that our set isn't beautiful because it is. Um, but the tissue set is stunning. And when the Gelder uh, paper set was on the market, um, it, uh, its initial price was $3,000 for the full 20 volumes and the 20 portfolios. And the Japanese tissue was 3850 
But, you know, and I, I went there and I'm all, you know, Curtis snob and I'm thinking, well, I've got my own set. I don't need to see theirs. And then I saw the tissue set and it's really, really beautiful. So um, it's really kind of neat to see how many people are, are interested in the work that Curtis is doing and that we're able to do this exhibition at a time that you will see more coming out in terms of Curtis because his 150th anniversary uh, of his birth is coming up in 2018. So I want to start with a quote by our dear friend Alfred Stieglitz. Uh, many of you know who that is, but I will go into Alfred Stieglitz uh, throughout this presentation. And this is where I got the title uh, for this talk from. And it's an article that he wrote in American Amateur Photographer in 1893, the same year that he became editor of this magazine. And he's arguing a point here, and he writes, there are many schools of painting. Why should there not be many schools of photographic art? There is hardly a right or wrong answer in these matters, but there is truth, and that should form the basis of all photographic works of art. The means are but secondary, and whatever the school, whether impressionist, realist, naturalist, or call it whatever you may, stick to truth in nature. And both of those ideas, the idea of truth and then the, also, the idea of why can't there be many schools of photographic art, I think are really interesting when applied to somebody like Edward Curtis. Because what does photographic truth, truth really mean? In particular, what does it mean um, when you're looking at um, something that's combination art and ethnography? Um, and then does Alfred Stieglitz really believe that as time goes on? Does he really think that it's okay to have multiple schools and different people can do different types of photography and everybody's one big happy family? Um, you probably know where I'm going if you know Stieglitz. The answer is no. Um, so again, this is what we're referring to. Edward Curtis is a North American Indian, uh, which was produced between 1907 and 1930. And that's exceedingly important. The fact that he is producing 20 volumes of work that has more than 2,000 photographs in it, over 1,500 are in the 20 volumes. The 20 volumes, you can see all of them out in the exhibition. Plus there are 723 portfolio prints, and we have about 10% of those on the wall in the exhibition. That's a lot of photographs. And that's over 23 years, and actually it's a little bit more because he dips back into um, some works that he made earlier than 1907 as well. And he goes up to about 1928 um, in terms of what he includes. And he's making over 40,000 photographs in this time period and then reducing down to the about 2,500 that we deal with. Um, so that's a lot of um, editing. And it's also a very long time in the history of photography to be sticking to a particular mode of making art. And Curtis, in some ways, sets himself up because he originally wanted a smaller grouping of books and, and prints. Uh, but J.P. Morgan said, well, if I'm going to back you on this, we should, you know, 20 sounds better. So how do you do 20 volumes of ethnographic research and photographs? Um, originally, uh, he thought he was going to do it in five years, and it took 23. What I'd like to do as we talk about these works is um, deal with Alfred Stieglitz and Edward Curtis um, in some ways at the same time, because you'll notice they're almost direct contemporaries. Uh, Alfred Stieglitz was born in 1864, Curtis in 68. And Stieglitz dies in 1946, and Curtis dies in 1952. So they are making photographs, thinking about photography, and thinking about the art of photography at the exact same time. And they are both incredibly influential at the same time. They're both American. Of course, Alfred spends some time in Germany learning um, chemistry and so on. But they both have very, very strong voices um, in the photography world as they are working on their various projects. And one thing that I love to think about, you know, we often think of Alfred Stieglitz as east of the Mississippi, even though he was married to Georgia O'Keeffe, and she, of course, comes out to Abiquiu and Ghost Ranch in, um, in New Mexico. Stieglitz never went with her, and he had actually never gone west of, the west, uh, west of the Mississippi in his lifetime. And when we think about Curtis, we think of him constantly being west of the Mississippi. However, uh, Curtis did go east of the Mississippi, and he had an office for the North American Indian Corp Incorporated. He had to make money because um, J.P. Morgan only gave him $75,000, $15,000 a year for five years, and um, there was no salary for Curtis himself included in that. So he had to, sh he had to sell this body of work. So there were people um, 
on Fifth Avenue doing that. And he had an office that he would quite often visit and, and do shows and so on. And it's approximately an eight minute walk from Curtis's office that he had from about 1906 to 1916 to 291 Fifth Avenue, which was originally the little, uh, little galleries of the photo secession from 1902 until about 1908 that Edward Curtis um, showed photography in. And then it became um, 291 because he started branching out outside of photography. So I like to think of uh, Curtis pr practically running down Fifth Avenue because you know he's somebody who climbs Mount Rainier and Mount Hood. He's no, he's no slacker when it comes to walking. So eight minutes would probably be about four or five for him. And they definitely did know each other and know of each other. And Stieglitz, who um, was showing many, many photographs in various exhibitions as his um, star rose in terms of the history of photography and the, the conception of modern photography, um, he very much favored Curtis's pictorialist work and showed it in a number of exhibitions, including an important photo secessionist exhibition that was held at the Albright Knox Art Gallery in the um, early, it was 19, I think it was 1910 or 1911. So they definitely knew of each other and Curtis was in this milieu. Even though he was stuck in certain constraints, he was not fully stuck. He knew what his contemporaries were doing in terms of photography. However, his output, his output has to look different and it does look different. So here I show you Alfred Stieglitz, somebody who was very, very interested in pictorialism and making beautiful pictorialist photographs in the 1890s. Uh, this is the flat iron in New York on the left, photo gravure, and then on the right-hand side, looking northwest from the Shelton, which was his residence in Manhattan with uh, Georgia O'Keeffe from 1932. And I think just looking at these two, you can see how his vision changed and modernized in those uh, really three decades. The problem, as I mentioned earlier, with Edward is he's stuck in a rubric. He's got to put out 20 volumes of the North American Indian. And what he started, he really wanted to finish. So how modern could he possibly become without turning off the individuals who many of them had paid for their subscriptions up front in 1907, 1908, 1910? He was working of a kind in a set and he was um, in some ways stuck there but not, not completely, and I'll show you some examples of that. And I, and I think you can see some of that too, certainly uh, The Vanishing Race Navajo, which is, um, which is image number one in portfolio number one, and it's on view in the exhibition, is very moody, very pictorial. I'll talk more about pictorialism in a second. And then when you see uh, from 1927, uh, a Wichita, this photogravure that is also part of the portfolios, um, there are hints of modernity here, but it, it kind of takes a little while to parse them out, so we'll do some of that. We can all go all the way back to the very, very early years of the history of photography um, to see the manner in which pictorialism rises to the top in the 1890s and the early, uh, very early 80, uh, early 20th century. This is an image by William Henry Fox Talbot who made one of the earliest, if not the earliest, positive to negative processes in photography. This is called The Open Door from 1844. Um, if you've ever seen a Vermeer or our, our lovely uh, Dutch artists, our Dutch painters from the 17th century, I think you can get a feel for what is happening here. Um, this is a salted paper print, very delicate. It's a paper negative. Um, that has been laid upon a, uh, a light sensitive sheet of paper and put out in the light and it becomes a positive image, absolutely stunning, very, very Dutch in its uh, composition as well, although Talbot is English. And, and such beautiful subtleties, even though um, calotypes are very delicate and over time they start to lose some tone, so it's lighter than it probably was when he originally made it. But you can still see the individual uh, casement um, panes in the windows in the, on the back wall of this wonderful room. So you get this beautiful sense, um, this artistic display, compositionally beautiful, refers to painting. And this is something that photographers are thinking about very, very early on as photography is uh, moved into the public sphere, particularly after 1839 when the daguerreotype becomes public. Another uh, English fellow, Henry Peach Robinson, our lovely Victorian friends in England, were very, very interested in the ways that uh, paintings um, could influence photographs. I'm sorry, I'm so close to the mic. Um, 
but this is an image called Fading Away, which is actually a, a print from multiple glass negatives. There was a desire to um, make photographs that were very Victorian in terms of um, moralizing and storytelling and so on. But because of uh, the photographic technology at the time that was not always particularly easy to do, and it almost couldn't be done in a single negative. So there were a number of people working who uh, learned how to um, use multiple negatives on one sheet of paper to make an image like this. The lighting on the young woman could not be done in a single negative to have the father in the background um, kind of grieving and looking outside the window. It just wasn't possible at the time because of the chemistry. So if anybody ever tells you that uh, that Photoshop is ruining photography, you can point them back to 1858 and fading away because photography has always been manipulated. Um, I show you here a variant of the one image uh, of the young woman who's fading away in the foreground. She never told her love from 1857. Uh, and this also stands on its own as a beautiful, sad, morose, Victorian type of image. These types of photographs and the photographers were absolutely influenced by um, the pre-Raphaelites in England, uh, these, uh, the brotherhood of the pre-Raphaelites who were um, kind of disgusted by the, the British Academy and, and Turner and so on and, and uh, forgetting who the other painters were at the time, but uh, they weren't interested in showing up the Academy. They wanted to return to a pre-Raphael stage where um, the scenes were more moralistic and, um, and religious and so on, and also very, very detailed, kind of like medieval painters would go. So here's the beautiful uh, Malay of Ophelia. I think you can certainly see some uh, some conversation there between this painting and this photograph. Uh, this painting, of course, made a little bit earlier than the print. Uh, and this is a beautiful example of a moralizing image during the Victorian age, and actually uh, Queen Victoria bought one of these uh, for her husband uh, before he passed away, this Oscar Rylander image. And uh, this is the two ways of life, incredibly moralizing. So you see on the left-hand side, we have one gentleman who kind of um, is... Uh, hearing the call, the young man, if you see him kind of cocking his ear to the side, there's a whole lot of gambling going on and ladies without tops and, and drinking and so on. And then there's a second gentleman um, who more nobly looks to the right-hand side, the non-sinister side, at virginal women who are reading and um, different people who are thinking about the world and thinking about philosophy and so on. And this is a total... I don't want to say rip off, but I will, uh, of uh, Raphael's uh, The School of, Ath uh, School of Athens, where we have uh, Plato on one side, Aristotle on the other. This is not quite as moralizing. This is more about being celestial and being of the earth. But you see these two, um, these two poles together um, in this type of work. So again, these photographers are very, very interested in making images that recall art and painting and history and they're doing that in many ways because so many people, uh, and oftentimes people who have um, columns at the ready who can print in newspapers or magazines are saying that photography is not really an art, that it's more of a science and it's, it's objective and it should be used for science, but it can't possibly be artistic, be artistic because it's too machine-like. Here's another beautiful example, uh, Julia Margaret Cameron, uh, The Parting of Lancelot and Guinevere. Uh, she is someone who very romantically in the 18, uh, late 1850s into the 1870s was um, working with these uh, beautiful albumen prints and these wet collodion negatives to make exquisite kind of painterly images that again are either moralizing or refer to literature or the Bible. Uh, so to move forward a little bit, here is an image by Gertrude Casebeer from 1902 of Alfred Stieglitz who is someone who uh, becomes an incredible proponent, not only of pr uh, pictorialism, which is a movement that grows out of photographers like uh, Rylander and so on, uh, but then becomes a real proponent for modernism uh, right around the time of World War I. And this is a beautiful example of a pictorialist image or a photo secession image. You can see it's very, very brushy. Um, it's a apparently a platinum print, it, um, gum prints also look like this quite often. Um, photographers loved platinum or gum because uh, they were able to 
manipulate the print in ways that you could not do with a gelatin silver print. And by the turn of the century, many people were starting to use gelatin silver. And I'll show the differences of those in, in just a moment. Gertrude Casebier is actually very, very interesting too because she is someone who photographed Native Americans, but from Buffalo Bill's show. So she would photograph the Sioux um, who were part of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show uh, when they would travel on the East Coast. So she is someone who is in conversation in some ways with Edward Curtis, and their photographs did show together at certain times. Um, but I think this shows you just how painterly a photograph can be, and how so many people around the turn of the century were attempting to make photographs that looked like prints or looked like paintings. How does this type of information get out to the general public throughout the United States and also throughout Europe? Uh, through the printed press is certainly one way. Camera Notes was a magazine, a publication that the uh, Camera Club of New York produced, and Stieglitz took that over for a while and eventually got frustrated because he pretty much gets frustrated with everyone and, and storms off and starts his own product. Um, and so in 1903, he started uh, Camera Work, which was a 50-volume uh, magazine that ended up running until about 1917. But these were the ways that individuals throughout the United States and also through Europe were learning about how other people were thinking about photography artistically. How do I make a platinum print? Um, what subject matters would be interesting? Which of the world's fairs are having sections devoted to photography that I can uh, enter into to see if my photographs will be chosen? as you know, best from the United States or best from um, England, best from the US. Um, and there are many of these, and there were camera clubs um, that would often produce their own magazines and their own pamphlets as well. There was an Oregon camera club, and something very interesting that camera clubs would do is they would send a, um, around to each other throughout the United States and even into Europe and into Canada. They would send sets of lantern slides, and I'll show you some lantern slides in a bit, uh, from their uh, members from, say, the Oregon Camera Club, it would go to the uh, the New York Camera Club, and people would have lantern slide nights, and they would be able to look through all of Oregon's camera clubs' lantern slides. So that's another way that information got out, and that was very, very typical uh, throughout the late 19th century and early 20th century. So now we have the internet, but back in the day they had the uh, magazines and then uh, the post in order to send lantern slides about. Camera Craft was a magazine that uh, was produced in San Francisco actually for, uh, for a bit of a time and then was taken over by another magazine. And so this was another voice of artistic photography as well, right around the time that Curtis is establishing his uh, portrait studio. In, uh, in Seattle, just north from us. So what I'd like to do now is show you why someone like Curtis would choose the photogravure process. It makes sense, certainly, if he originally thought, and Morgan originally thought, that he would be making 500 sets of the North American Indian, um, and there are over 2,500 images that need to be made. Is it better to have them mechanically printed or should they be made one at a time um, as a gelatin silver print and then tipped in to every page on every book and then um, made as a set together for the volumes? That's complex and it's also not as artistic. And Curtis is He's a man who, even though he does a lot of ethnographic work, he's an artist first. And the portraits that he makes in Seattle are stunningly beautiful images. They're not your run-of-the-mill kind of documentary snaps or an inexpensive, um, inexpensive portrait studio, which is not to say we don't see wonderful things from inexpensive ones, but he really paid attention to the images he was making. And he was also an engraver. Uh, for quite some time in Seattle before he moved on to only doing photographic work. So it makes sense that for something so large and for someone who is so interested in pictorialism and the art of photography, that he would choose to make photogravures. And photogravures, up until recently, were not necessarily seen as artistic, but that was sort of a retread for the, um, for the photogravure. Photogravure prints were considered 
as good as other prints back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Even though they were um, being made, um, the image, a positive, was turned into an etching plate, and the etching plate was one, run through a press. Stieglitz and uh, Paul Strand, and as we know, Edward Curtis, made stunning, stunning photogravures, and they were considered just as beautiful as a platinum print. And actually, sometimes, if the engraver is really good and the... Um, the shop that did the, uh, the printing is really good. It's oftentimes hard for us to figure out if a print now that was made back in the early 20th century is a photogravure or a platinum print. And so we oftentimes have to have conservators check that out and do microscopic work. And so and the other, um, there are a couple other preferred modes. So photogravure was very hot in terms of pictorialism, beautiful artistic images, as was platinum platinum prints and things like gun by, gun by chromate. And I'll show you why. Um, this is a wonderful, if you like looking at um, information about the history of photographer and uh, photography and processes, there's this wonderful website called Graphics Atlas, and it's run through the Image Permanence Institute at University of Rochester. And they work in conjunction with the George Eastman Museum. And so, they will show you what prints look like close up. And if you look at this full print, um, that's a platinum print, it almost looks like a gelatin silver, right, on this screen. You get closer, you can see, especially at 50 times magnification, the fiber of the paper shows through. There's no baryta layer, there's no gelatin between the art paper that could be used for um, a print that would go through a press, um, and then the, um, the platinum that is being applied directly to the print. So what happens is it becomes much more brush-like, much softer than a gelatin silver print, um, and much more artistic to certain eyes at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and here's an example of a photogravure detail. And you can see some of this as well if you take a good look. Oftentimes in raking lights, you kind of have to get down. The security guards might look at you a little funny, but uh, it's okay. If you kind of get down and you look, um, get light to bounce off of our prints in the exhibition, you can see the fibers of the paper in Edward Curtis's photogravures, and that makes it a little bit softer, a little bit more painterly. And so that was really a, kind of a beloved way of making artistic photographs. Um, and for good fun, I'm showing you here in honor of our cat painting. This is a gelatin silver print. Um, this is at 10 times magnification, uh, I'm sorry, then it's at 30 times, and then it's at 50 times. And you notice that you can't see the toothiness of the paper. That's because there's a baryta layer. There's a layer that restricts the gelatin silver from and the silver, and um, excuse me, from seeping into the paper itself from the the support underneath. And if you look um, at 50 times the gelatin silver and then 50 times the uh, photogravure, I think you can, can see the difference there. So Edward, uh, excuse me, Alfred Stieglitz, our dear friend um, who is in Europe in the late 1880s, early 1890s, and then brings all this chemistry knowledge and then um, all of this artistic knowledge back with him to New York, um, is absolutely enthralled by pictorialism, and he wants to help make photography seem like an art and stand on the same level as prints and drawings and paintings as well. So we have a couple examples here. We have Venetian Canal from 1894, which is, uh, it's a photogravure, but it's quite a beautiful print. Um, a lot of great photogravure presses in Germany um, and in England as well. So technologically, uh, beautiful work happening in Europe. And then this photogravure that we see on the right-hand side, the hand of man, um, the subject matter is a little bit different. He's now working in New York, and he is turning his camera to a subject matter that is a little more grungy and real world, certainly, than we might see with some uh, pictorialists. But you can see how it's still very, very soft. If this negative were applied to a gelatin silver print, it wouldn't be quite as moody. The tones would be uh, more varied and there would certainly be more contrast, but pictorialists like um, kind of a, a smoggy, kind of foggy tone that takes over the entire image, almost makes it dreamlike. So this is very, even though it feels a little gritty, it's also very uh, romantic. And I show you in contrast 
a beautiful painting by Child Hassam. We're very lucky to have some Child Hassam uh, paintings in our collection. And this is uh, from the MFA Boston. This is at dusk, Boston Common at twilight. You can see that here's someone who's working um, toward the end of uh, the Impressionist period in, in American Impressionism. And it's a beautiful, beautiful scene, but it's still a little bit gritty. We get that sense of city life and the way that the, the pure snow has been trampled down on the Boston Common as, as everyone is out uh, walking along. The subject matter is quite beautiful. We see this uh, wonderful mother with children. If we think of someone like Mary Cassatt, that's very typical of, um, of Impressionist work. And that is also true. Um, the ladies are quite popular with our pictorialists. Here's another Gertrude Kazebeer, an image called The Manger from about 1899. And this is a platinum print. Again, a lot of references to women, to spirituality, to motherhood um, and to nature and how women in many ways are related to nature. And the soft tone of the platinum print or the gum print or the, the photogravure really lends itself to this warm, mothering, caring type of image. It's very soft, very uh, almost like Vaseline on the lens and very beautiful. Here we have uh, Alice Boughton and Anne Brigman. Um, women were very active photographers within the photo secession, which is the, the group that uh, um, Alfred Stieglitz put together around the turn of the 20th century. Um, and they were often included in his camera work magazine. Uh, so we have the seasons on the left. Can you tell who winter is? Probably doesn't take too long to figure that out. The one in the dark who's turned away. Um, and then on the right, we have Anne Brigman, the bubble. And so we do have a lot of women who are in the nude, who are communing with nature, because again, women are considered kind of uh, fecund and closer to nature, certainly, than men are, and perhaps more innocent. Um, and then a lot of women do show up in the pictorialist world with these glass bubbles, which I find. So, you know, I still, uh, you know, every so often when I talk about pictorialism, I try to do more and more research, like, why the bubble? Why the bubble? And there are some reasons because it, you know, it, it symbolizes the earth. It symbolizes Mother Earth, certainly. You will sometimes see uh, children with the, the bubble as well. I don't know if I've ne necessarily seen any men with the bubble, but we often see these young maidens out in beautiful, brushy, gorgeous nature um, with these glass spheres, which is, spheres, which is really... Um, I don't think how the world worked at that time, but what do I know? It's a very rarefied world. Pictorialism is very gentle, often very, very innocent, and it's removed from, in many ways, kind of the reality of uh, the approaching 20th century and the machine age and so on. But I think you can see where all of this would certainly have been influential and important to someone like Edward Curtis, uh, these two images are not on view, um, but you are, if you ever uh, would like to look at all 723 of the, um, the uh, portfolio prints, our team photographed them and they're all on our website, so you can actually look through them one by one, so you can go to our online collections to see them. But I think that you can get a sense of how the tropes that are used by the pictorialists, and it comes certainly from anywhere from the pre-Raphaelites to the Impressionists, moves its way to the Pictorialists and then moves its way into this beautiful yet historical ethnographic work that Curtis is doing. And that's where somebody like Curtis, um, I don't want to say gets in trouble, but certainly makes things more complicated, right? When we now, a hundred some odd years later, are looking uh, back at these images as facts. And this is a stunner. This one is on view. Uh, this is the Storm Apache. Um, utterly romantic, just from the foreground to the middle ground to the stormy background. Here you can see the tones are within a particular range. It's not contrasty. It's not harsh. The, the feeling of it in some ways is harsh. It's very, very heavy. The storm you know, is approaching. They're about to go through a storm, and so that gets very meta, right? Because um, here are these Native Americans who are systematically being pushed onto reservations and losing their culture. Um, but as an image, it's incredibly romantic and absolutely stunning. Just a beautiful, beautiful image. What I want to show you now 
is something that um, you don't often necessarily get to see or maybe don't think about when you think about the North American Indian. It wasn't released in a very um, normal way. So if you look at this chart, um, and in particular, I want you to look at the years around World War I. The first volume was released in 1907, then you've got eight, nine, you skip to 11. Things slow down between 13 and 15 and 16, and there are a number of different reasons for that. Um, Curtis has to resource um, at some point, and I, forgive me, I don't remember exactly when it is, but he has to um, find different sources for paper and for binding and for printing. And, and then when you hit a world war, people are not necessarily interested in giving you cash to continue a project like this. Their mind is on other things. Um, and he's, he's kind of, he's slowing down. He's doing as much of the work as he can, but he's slowing down because of resources and so on. So there are no volumes released between 1917 and 1921. And those are key years when photography, if not the entire art world, is changing quite dramatically, right? So he has stepped out in many ways of the photographic world, of this particular project. He hasn't stepped out completely of the photographic world. Um, but the, the, the art world is changing at this time. And I show you a couple of examples here. Here's um, John Sloan and George Bellows, uh, often considered two of the group, the eight, um, also known as the Ashcan School who are American artists who are in some ways like Stieglitz did in 1902 when he took that railroad scene, but it was kind of beautiful and murky. They are now looking at the, the city around them, right? Cities are getting packed and they're kind of dirty, but they're also exciting and there's so much going on there and technology is increasing trains and taller buildings and so on and so forth. And people are getting more casual a pictorialist would most likely never photograph women drying their hair in their skivvies on a Sunday. They might photograph women who are nude, but that's too close to earth when they're doing something that they would do normally that's like a chore. And they most certainly wouldn't photograph and make an image of something like George Bellows' cliff, cliff dwellers when he goes down to you know the tenements of the Lower East Side. Um, there is a new kind of excitement and interest for various reasons, as I mentioned, about artists and you know the world that artists are experiencing them around them. And all hell is breaking loose, certainly, in Europe. So when we think about someone like Marcel Duchamp, who is so interested in movement and working with cubism and moving forward in terms of the manner in which we can portray an individual moving in through space. And New Descending a Staircase, I always love to bring this up. It was part of um, the uh, Armory Show of 1913 in New York, and it, uh, part of the Armory Show traveled here to the Portland Art Museum. So New Descending a Staircase showed here. So our forebears, if you will, while they were looking at photography, because we were showing photography as uh, early as 1905 at the Portland Art Museum, they were also seeing this avant-garde art by European artists. Um, but there, there's this real interest in technology and automatons and where individuals end and the machine begins. And so we get um, beautiful sculptures like uh, Baccione's Unique Forms of Continuity in Space from 1913. Um, and if you think about people like the Italian, uh, the futurists, who are very, very interested in the machine and movement and nihilism, and um, World War I comes along and a lot of them go into uh, World War I into battle and they don't come back, the world is changing very quickly as Curtis is trying to capture the very rapidly changing world of uh, the Native American Indian west of the west of the Mississippi. Alfred Stieglitz keeps up with this. Uh, so remember I mentioned earlier on um, his gallery on Fifth Avenue used to be uh, the little galleries of the photo secession. By 1908, he was the first person showing Picasso and Brock. He starts to get away from photography to a certain extent. So in 1908, he changes the name to Gallery 291 because he's no longer only promoting and showing photography. And I show you this image here. This is an installation view of Picasso and Brock from 1915, um, where he is bringing in 
um, such different, diverse, you know, Cubist imagery and uh, avant-garde imagery, both being made in Europe and then also in the uh, United States. Um, image makers like John Marin and Marsden Hartley also. This is the type of work he's showing, uh, 1916, 1914, 1915, during World War I. So the world is moving on as Curtis is locked in this rubric, in this uh, pattern of work. Stieglitz is also changing. So remember, if we think about that 1893 statement, well, why can't there be many schools of photographic art? Well, actually, Stieglitz isn't all that interested in many schools. He likes what he likes when he likes it. And then when he moves on, he expects everybody else to move on. And if they don't move on quickly enough, he leaves them behind. So as time goes on, pictorialism was still trying to figure out where it was going to go next in the teens during World War I. Um, but it really starts to die out by 1920, particularly on the East Coast. It lasts longer on the West Coast. There are wonderful camera clubs, particularly in Seattle um, and, Victor and L.A. too. Uh, I think San Francisco. Pictorialism in these camera clubs lasted longer, and the work that was done in the late 20s and even early 30s is stunning. It's really, really beautiful. But the East Coast starts getting rid of it and pushing it out um, by the late teens into the early 20s. And Alfred Stieglitz liked, likes to um, rest all of it, all of his change to modernity uh, on the steerage uh, from 1907. And um, if you've heard me talk about the steerage before, um, I think a lot of what he says is, is quite made up, actually, and I think he he's uh, you know he's rewriting his own his own history, and he tries to make it into this thing where it's all about um, you know this legend about he only has one more sheet of film for his camera, and he feels so badly for all the people in steerage, but yet he's up on the upper deck and he can't mingle with them because he's a first class passenger, and woe is he because uh, he should be down there with them. Um, but he's also very, very interested in the top hat and the way that the light um, reflects off the top hat of the man who's on, in first class. And then this wonderful, strong uh, kind of vertical of the stairwell and then the, the gangplank. Uh, so he talks about these things. Um, he recasts this image. And for him, this is where modernism in photography starts for him. So he starts to pull away from the romanticism of pictorialism by this point, or at least he says. I could probably talk about this for hours, but I, I won't bore you with that. Um, and so what you see here is about 10 years later, on the right-hand side, a photograph that he's making of Georgia O'Keeffe. This is not the type of image that a pictorialist would make, right? This is a woman who is, first of all, named. She's not symbolizing something greater, like an emotion or a thought or a philosophy. She is Georgia O'Keeffe. She is um, posed in front of one of her own charcoal drawings. Her hands are crafted in such a way that we understand that her hands are part of her and um, are, what make, are what make this incredible uh, work. And she's you know, holding place within this image very strongly. Um, and even though this is a platinum print, it's starting to get a little less feathery, a little less uh, brushy, and a little less painterly. It's interesting, too, because Alfred, because he is so busy moving 291 forward with all sorts of different um, artwork, whether it's sculpture uh, or painting, he's not making a lot of photographs, kind of around the same time that Edward Curtis isn't doing as much work as he would like to on the North American Indian. Curtis is always taking photographs throughout uh, you know, World War I and so on, but he's just not getting them published as quickly. Something else that I'd like to show you, and I had mentioned um, lantern slides earlier, there are uh, people who are using photography as document in order to show truths of the world. The term document is not applied to photographs until really the early 1930s. And it's a, um, a word that comes about in the 1920s because of film, comes through the film industry. Um, but we use it, we sort of reverse apply it now. Because if we're talking about somebody like Lewis Hine who is working for the um, um, Child Labor Committee, who he's going in between 1908 and 1918 and using subterfuge, photographing children working illegally in mills um, and so on. Um, 
this is another way that photography is being used, but he's someone who has also been trained in, in, in the arts and knows about uh, painting and so on. So even though his photographs don't look pictorial necessarily, he's um, being very, very careful about the ways that he uses light. If you look at his Ellis Island images, he's applying um, the idea of the Madonna to these women who are um, just arriving at Ellis Island from Europe and so on. So lantern slide shows are the ways that the National Child Labor Committee is showing to people, um, a la John Sloan and uh, George Bellows, uh, the truths about tenement piecework and then the, uh, the mills and so on, whether it's in Massachusetts or North Carolina. What I show you here is at the same time, an image called Watching the, Damper, uh, the Dancers, which is a plate, uh, an image made in 1906 of, of, of Hopi women. And then on the right side, a glass lantern slide that was made from it. So at the same time that um, Lewis Hine is showing these very quote unquote real images of children in the factories, Curtis is trying to drum up money and excitement for the North American Indian, and he's making these touring musicals that are also using magic lantern slides that are actually um, painted and colored very, very beautifully. So there's a very stark difference between the types of truths that are going on here, right? We've got the young mill worker, and he's being kind of overshrouded by these older, kind of mean-looking men. And then we have these beautiful... Um, this beautiful setting, this sunset that actually doesn't even exist in the photogravure, right? But it's painted in um, into this slideshow. And then there was music that would accompany the slideshow. And Curtis would talk all about uh, the vanishing race, and people would hopefully get their own subscriptions. So what I show you here is ways in which modernity has certainly moved into the North American Indian, but it is oftentimes quite subtle. And that was something that was really nice for me to be allowed the time to look through all of these image and, images and pay attention to them. There are subtle slippages, if you will. Um, if you see the Scout Apache from 1906 on the left and then Black Man uh, from 1927 on the right, you might begin to notice what I mean. Um, he is still using the photogravure process. He's doing most of what he was doing from 20 years ago, but there is a lot more contrast. Even the composition is less romantic. It is still a man on a horse. Um, this man is not wearing a loincloth, number one. He's also photographed almost from the same height. He's not photographed below. And even the horizon line just feels much more um, straight and geometric and modern, if you will. Here's an image, they're both by Curtis, Chief of the Desert from 1904, and then Serge Ukrainsky from 1927. Curtis is moving on in his own life. He does start a photographic studio in LA in the late uh, teens after his wife gets the original uh, Curtis um, studio in Seattle in the divorce. He and his daughter open a photo studio in LA. So he's photographing individuals um, who are part of the film industry and actors and dancers and models. And so he's very, very aware of um, modern portraiture. And you see that in aspects of the other work that he makes. And we're very fortunate. We have this print um, of Serge in our collection. So it's a lovely um, image to kind of contrast with the work that he was doing for the North American Indian. And I also remind you that he is someone who didn't necessarily want to be stuck with pictorialism. He was interested in the movie camera as early as 1903-1904, when it's brand new on the market, and the Lumiere brothers it hasn't been that long since they were beginning work in motion picture. And I show you a couple of images by uh, other photographers, stills that are made um, during the filming in the land of the headhunters that Curtis made in 1914. So he is someone who is up to date on technology and is very interested and aware of what is going on with him outside of this one major project. And here's an example that I show you of what I like to call slippage. Um, this is Kwakutl House frame from 1914. And this image is on view in the exhibition. This image is exceptionally modern. 
exceptionally so. I mean, it's a little brushy, it's a little soft and so on, but this almost um, worm's eye view and these very strong diagonals and seeing from below um, this incredibly strong, it's not quite cubist, but this incredibly strong geometric composition is something that doesn't look like images that he's making around the same time, right? These are also architectural images and, and, and images of, uh, of posts and totems and so on, so they're a little more descriptive. That is a stunning image. And that, to me, presages people like Paul Strand, who is in New York um, during the war and who is seeing and working with uh, Alfred Stieglitz a lot. Um, during the late uh, middle and late teens. And then someone like Charles Sheeler, we know his modernist paintings a lot, but his modernist um, photographs are outstanding as well. This is uh, crisscross conveyor belts when he photographed the River Rouge plant, the Ford plant um, in 1927. So he's presaging this beautiful, stunning, strong um, machine age work. What I'd like to do to kind of round out the conversation, I've been going on for a while, um, is to indicate that, you know, there are a lot of issues that come up, certainly, and, and there are many ways that uh, Native Americans were photographed beyond Edward Curtis, the way that he was doing it. And I show you this as an example. This is a, a, a rather stunning Timothy O'Sullivan image. It was made in 1872 of a Paiute group. Um, I think one of the the issues with Curtis is that when we think about Native Americans, oftentimes we're locked into the images that he made of them in, in war bonnets or traditional dress, so, you know, um, elk tooth dresses. I said elk tooth dresses at um, one of the uh, other tours the other day, and um, I'll just clarify because it was confusing. Um, you can see them in Wendy Redstar's photographs, um, elk tooth tooth dresses are dresses that have elk teeth sewn onto them. And that was a, a symbol of stature and so on. And now the elk teeth, you can't get them anymore, so they're plastic, but, um, but they're still representative of, of really important things in, in particular tribes. Um, but we oftentimes see, for the most part, Edward Curtis's images, so we feel like Native Americans are frozen in amber and they looked a particular way, and that's how it was even at the turn of the century. But you can see here, that um, these uh, Paiute Indians are dressed in collared shirts, cotton shirts, and denim, and so on. And this is 1872. This is a couple of decades before Curtis even begins photographing. And if we look at work by someone like Lee Morehouse, who is working in Pendleton and photographing, um, we can see where these moments of cross-pollination, if you will, are happening. So um, again, these are right around the turn of the century when Curtis is gearing up to do his work for the North American Indian. We see collared shirts, we see um, an Indian police badge that is very Western, Western hats, Western fringe, but then um, also Native American uh, necklaces and so on. Um, so there are many, many photographers who are making images of Native Americans at the same time that Curtis is. Um, so it's always good if we have a moment to have a look at many of them. And I also uh, show you images by Curtis's own brother, uh, Asahel Curtis. There are multiple ways that people pronounce his name, but uh, Asahel is my understanding of it. And you can see here, 1915, during the war, he's making photographs of um, a Yakima chief's family, and they have calico dresses on, but then also their material culture with them, and they are standing in front of, in front of clappered houses. Um, so that is much more modern than the type of images, for the most part, that Curtis was making. And here's, um, I'm almost done, don't worry. Uh, here's an example, another uh, images of Asahel's photograph, um, and this is made in Alaska from 1930, uh, which I find very interesting. There are some um, hints of somebody like uh, Lewis Hine and his child labor committee images here, but this is certainly, um, from what I can read, it's a gelatin silver print, so it's a little bit more stark, but it, it's a young woman making gloves sitting on the ground. There are people standing around her, and it feels very modern to me in a, a WPA sort of way. And this is a um, this is a variant of migrant mother. So the um, 
the alphabet soup of the government, the Works Progress Administration, administration is, is about to gear up at this point as Asahel is photographing in Alaska and making these images that feel documentary and artistic all at the same time. And this is also not very long after Curtis has completely finished his project. And it is very interesting that, for the most part, people were not interested in the North American Indian by the time 1930 comes along and he um, produces his last volume. Number one, pictorialism is something that has gone away. People are much more interested in documentary imagery like you see with people like Dorothea Lange or maybe Lewis Hine. Um, the... Uh, Glitterati, if you will, in New York has definitely moved on to other types of photography. Um, and the culture wasn't as interested in Native Americans anymore either. Everyone was now off of their original lands. The West had been settled, quote unquote. People were on their reservations. There wasn't anything left to save. The vanishing race has vanished. We all know that that's not true, of course. And the images that you see um, in volumes 19 and 20 show that, that there's a very, uh, you know, many vibrant societies that still survive. But um, I think the combination of society having moved on and moved into the machine age and then the type of work that Curtis was in some ways stuck doing kept him within this place that didn't allow him to perhaps move forward um, aesthetically in a way that he would have wanted to. So um, in some ways that's not necessarily a bad thing. It wasn't great for him, but it's good for us because people left these book volumes and these portfolios alone for about four decades. People were not interested in them again until the 1970s. And because so many of them were in libraries, they were left on the shelves and they weren't handled. So the curator in me feels good about that, although I feel badly about Curtis and that nobody was interested in him anymore by the, the 40s and even into the 50s. Um, but for us, that means that these documents, these objects, are for the most part still in excellent shape. And we can revisit them now um, with the kind of understanding of time and of history and apply what we know more. Um, you know, we can look in the rearview mirror and hopefully get a better, larger sense about them. Uh, but I think it's also very important to understand that Curtis was uh, a man of his time, both in terms of the way he saw the vanishing race, which was a popular term at the time, and also the artistic photographer that he was and how these two things came together in this large grouping uh, called the North American Indian. So that is all I have for you today. I'm more than happy to take questions. And as I mentioned, it's best that we do questions and I'm doing them from afar. Um, so if you have something that you would like to say, please feel free to say it now. If you raise your hand, we have microphones for you so that everybody can hear your question. We'd appreciate that you use the microphone. Or did I cover it all and you just have no questions whatsoever? There are a couple up front. Great, thanks. Hi, um, I just have uh, one question that's sort of, I mean, there was an image you showed by Stieglitz of the, of the Picasso and Brock exhibition, which is not super specific to the topic of your talk, but um, has that photo been up in the galleries in the last year? It looked very familiar. Yes, they were. Um, so that photograph, I wonder if I can get back to it pretty quickly. I probably can. Um, it was, uh, and it's so interesting too. Uh, this image was in the galleries. Uh, if you remember the Bluff Collection exhibition that I did, which um, was an early modernist exhibition, it was up. It was in the Link Gallery, kind of close to where the cat painting is now. Yeah, and so this was in some ways um, almost a documentary photograph, but um, these are very much sought after at this point. Uh, on the market, so we were really, really fortunate um, to be able to have this lent to us uh, by a lender who shall remain anonymous at a time, but they were beautiful prints. Um, there were also Georgia O'Keeffe images in that show and then some Shelton uh, images too. So we had a nice range of, of uh, Stieglitz images. Unfortunately, we have no, in this collection, 
platinum prints or even gelatin silver prints by um, Alfred Stieglitz. We only have a couple of photogravures from um, camera work, uh, but they go for a lot of money now. So hopefully at some point someone will want to donate one to us, um, but they're very, very highly sought after. Any other questions? One straight in the front and then... And there will be one in the very front row as well, Allison. Uh, it, it looks to me, uh, at least on the projected uh, images here, that um, Curtis's uh, prints uh, don't have a, a large luminosity range from dark, dark to uh, whatever, paper white, I guess. Um, and also, I assume they're toned somehow. So they're actually not toned because they are ink. That is the color of the ink. They look toned, yeah. right? Um, but because it is a photogravure, it's not a silver process, it's an ink process. Uh -huh. So that is the tone of the ink. And the, the main inks that you would get would be this kind of, um, that's not one. Um, they are, um, you would get, uh, sepia was very popular, blue was sometimes popular, and then a grayish black was also popular. Yeah, so, uh, but for the most part, when you look at a photogravure, you will see something within this tonal range, uh, which makes it, it kind of adds on to that idea, I think, of nostalgia, at least for us. Uh -huh. So the, the inks being used were, were brown, essentially? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they were. And, and not yeah. And then the tonal range is, it is more limited than you will see in a gelatin silver print, especially a contrasty one. What is interesting is if you do see, and this is what I, I learned um, on Thursday at the University of Oregon, is that the ones that are on tissue are a little bit more luminous. It's very interesting because the tissue does allow some light in underneath it where you don't really get that with the Gelder paper that we have. So they are a little bit more luminous and there is a bit more of a tonal range to them. Um, but yeah, that is very typical of a, uh, a photogravure, a um, more restricted tonal range. Okay, thank you. Of course. It was the same question. The sepia, the sepia tones. Um, yeah. is, is that color stable? In other words, this is what it would look like then. Yeah, you know, it's pretty stable. Um, and stability is all relative, right? So if you place this out in the light like you would any other print on paper that is an ink print, um, the, the light will shift the tone over time. So that's why we keep our shows up for three months at a time, maybe four. That is why if you have prints, whether they're um, photographically based and are metal, metallic, or if they're ink, they're photogravures, uh, you will want to think about getting the best type of plexiglass you can to cover them to hold back all of the UV that you can, because over time it will change, whether it's ink or uh, a metallic print. Yeah, but it is interesting how this, um, this other layer, when you look at photogravures, they do, uh, we talk about uh, it, people who are in these Curtises, they almost feel like they're frozen and suspended in amber because um, they haven't really changed over time. That was the tone of the print from them. But when we think about 19th century photography, um, some of the earlier processes, like um, even the tintype or the... Um, um, Albumin prints, albumin because they're egg white, they, they tend to, to shift a little bit yellow. So it feels more old timey, right? Even though this is an ink that looked this tone, ours are in very good shape and you can see uh, pretty close to what the original tone was in ours on a display. It just feels old timey, but they, they, haven't, they haven't necessarily changed much at all. Hi, I just wanted to mention two different things about uh, Indian uh, photographs of Native Americans. One was John Collier, who was uh, part of the um, documentary work uh, during the 30s. Um, and his work was very different. It was, it was um, more like, um, oh, I blanked on her name, 
um, Dorothea Lang. Dorothea maybe. Lang, yeah, work, uh, mm-hmm. except on Native Americans, much more modern. The other was an exhibit I saw in Washington, D.C. a number of years ago, and I have the catalog at home, um, but it was fabulous because it took uh, photographs, and, and I, think, I think it was all photographs, from um, early um, 1800s, uh, or, or maybe it was also art, all the way up through, say, the 1930s or 40s, and it was very political, uh, and it showed how uh, the idea of Americans had. Uh, first, it was manifest destiny, uh, going in, and the uh, Indians were savages. And, and then later, it moved into something like Curtis, uh, the vanishing race, and it became much uh, mm, more benevolent. Uh, mm-hmm. Like that, and it was so political. It was supposed to travel the country. Was that the West as America? Yes, I think that was. Yeah, it. Bill Truitner, and yes, that and, was very political. And they um, they canceled it politically. Yeah. It was canceled. Yeah, which is a shame because it was fabulous. It is a shame, and that's something we talk about with Curtis. Is that oftentimes he's um, he's a very polarizing figure, and there's this period when the West as America happened. Um, uh, during art history when uh, there was a lot of revisionist art history happening in the 80s and 90s, which was very, very important to do, but it may have gone a little far. And so, uh, and the reaction needed to happen because um, the understanding of um, the uh, of uh, cultures that were not uh, dominant um, were affected quite a bit by their portrayals in 18th, 19th, early 20th century art. So uh, people like Bill Truitner um, and uh, one of my advisors to Pat Hills, um, it's pretty brutal. That show and that catalog is pretty brutal and quite raw. And so, yeah, people were really offended by it. And some of it may have gone a little bit far, but what's happening now is um, scholars are coming back in just a little bit um, and working with many of the same ideas that the West as America put forth. But I think um, it's just a bit more palatable for, for people and for a wider audience. But you're lucky to have seen that. That's a really important show, a very important catalog, too. Yeah, thanks for mentioning it. Anyone else? Was uh, Curtis able to sell all of the, uh, uh, the volumes that he, uh, so he lost money? Uh, yeah, and he I, did. And follow on question, um, how was it marketed? I mean, you didn't, how, have, you didn't have Amazon or, or Barnes and Noble, right. so how, how right. did the sale go on? So he did things like that um, 1911 musicale with the slides. Um, he did that and he would travel. They did that in San Francisco. Um, in 1905, his photographs were shown here during the Lewis and Clark exposition. Um, he would do, I, I'm gonna call them pop-up shows like we do pop-up shows at the museum now. Um, he would do pop-up shows at the Waldorf Astoria. He did them in DC at the Cosmos Club. Um, university clubs and so on, private clubs. He would do these pop-up shows, Rainier Club, uh, the Mazamas uh, here have quite a few of his photographs. So it was very much word of mouth. He had agents who would try to sell for him too and he had that that business um, located uh, the office front in New York where he was trying to get people to purchase it. Uh, And it is true, um, when the project was over, he had to le- let go of all of the plates and any of the, the leftover bound works um, and the uh, unbound sheets. And those all went to J.P. Morgan's son. And he sold them for about $1,000 to uh, a Boston uh, bookseller. And so the, the story goes, it's very Antiques Roadshow, right? They all, uh, they all went into the... Um, the basement and sat there for years until people started discovering these images again in in the library and um, somebody went down to the basement and found all of these loose prints and um, the the booksellers who bought it, I think it was the booksellers, it wasn't Morgan's son, um, they they put together a few more of the sets and sold those at a very reduced price. So it's really weird because um, I have a list from that bookseller where 
you get about 222 uh, of the sets that were made, and we know exactly where they went to. We know that the 20 that went to J.P. Morgan, one went to England, um, you know, to the king, and, uh, and that kind of thing, and all of these others went to universities, and ours came to us. Number 55 from Henrietta, Henrietta E. Failing. Um, but then you get these holes, and then you get set like 452, and that one went to um, uh, you know a university and so on. So it, it's interesting, but 500 were never made. They figure all together, including some that were made after the project was over, that there may be about 250. And some of those since were broken up. Fortunately, a lot of them did go to libraries or museums and weren't touched, but if there were people of means who purchased them and maybe their children or um, heirs weren't interested in it, they would just go to a bookseller and be split up. Some people cut up the books. That's not abnormal uh, during the 20th century to, to cut up books for the photographs and keep those and, and toss the rest away. Yeah, so they're about, they're pretty sure they're about 200 some odd that are still extant, unfortunately, in, uh, in uh, private collections. None with the Native American tribes that were photographed, though, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, one, yeah, thank you. How many of the plates have survived and where are they? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, some of the plates, I don't know if he, have all, he has all of them. There, there are quite a few plates left. Some were destroyed. And there's a gentleman by the name of Christopher Cardozo who, I don't know if it was in the 70s or the early 80s, bought up a lot of the stock, the leftover stock. And um, so he has many of the plates. He does exhibitions. He also makes new photograph reviewers and sells those, which breaks my heart a little, but that's the curator in me. Uh, other people might have different feelings about that. Um, and then I, I have to admit, I'm not sure if there are any institutions that have plates. I think there might be a couple here and there, but I'm not sure where. But, um, but yeah, if you see a Christopher Cordozo-sponsored um, show, which you might do in 2018 during the 150th year, you might be able to see some of the plates. The um, Indiana University has the 200 some odd of the uh, wax cylinders that are left. Uh, the, the voice and sound recordings, which is great because we were able to get those digitized and sent to us and Wendy Redstar uses that. Um, uh, they're crow recordings that she uses in her installation. So all of the, um, the recordings are, uh, the physical objects are, are at Indiana University. Uh, yeah, but the plates, there aren't, there are some, but not tons left. Yes. Microphone's coming. One sec. Well, they're also yeah. taping it, so it's going to go online. So <laughs> lucky me. Everybody gets to hear this. They want to listen to it on YouTube. I just think you've been very generous uh, Thanks. to come here and do this, feeling the way you are. Thank you. That's and very sweet. you sound sweet. like you need to go home. And my question I do. Is, <laughs> Thank you. My question is, kind. wouldn't you like to go home? I'm sorry. What was your question? I wouldn't mind going home, but I, I really wanted to give this, you know, I didn't really, we have so many other things, I didn't want to postpone it, and I wanted to give this talk, so, but now I would like to go home, but I do, I thank you all for putting up with thank my you. voice, thank you very much.